Good morning. Welcome to Policy Exchange. Uh, this is the first event in an extraordinary Conservative Party conference programme from Policy Exchange. Uh, extraordinary because we're all online, so if you're watching this from the future on our video archive, greetings from the thick of it. Um, but also extraordinary because the Policy Exchange team has pulled together an army of erudite and authoritative speakers um, to explore the biggest questions of the day and the decade. Um, you can find the full programme at policyexchange.org.uk. So what better topic with which to start off uh, than how to fuel the future? Um, hydrogen is the most abundant and most primordial element uh, of all. Um, it has the potential to provide clean energy for transport, heat and electricity. And the UK has a golden opportunity to become a world leader in its production. And for those reasons, it's winning political champions from the Prime Minister down. In 2018, Policy Exchange published a report to explore the potential for hydrogen, also called, sorry, that report was called uh, Fueling the Future. Um, our report recommended the development of hydrogen industrial clusters or hubs, especially in the north, to take advantage of things like existing industrial demand and geography. We also recommended that early development of green, green and blue hydrogen um, should aim to replace current hydrogen supply, which is mostly high in carbon emissions. Um, we argued for increasingly ambitious transport pilots to develop those technologies and so it is coming to pass. In the last few days and weeks, we've seen the launch of a hydrogen transport hub in Tees Valley, the maiden journey of the UK's first hydrogen train, um, designs for a hydrogen aeroplane, and we already have hydrogen buses and lorries operating on our roads. However, hydrogen is not uncontroversial. It is lower in energy density than natural gas. It has uh, potentially more volatility. Um, its supply chains are arguably more complicated and all of those things mean that there are arguably cheaper alternatives. So to explore all of these issues and many more, I'm joined by a panel drawn from academia, business and the political front lines. Uh, ben Houchen is the Conservative Mayor of Tees Valley and one of the leading champions of hydrogen and low carbon development in the Northeast. Josh Burke is a policy fellow at the Grantham Institute at the London School of Economics. Uh, he's also one of my predecessors at Policy Exchange and actually authored the report I've already mentioned on the future of hydrogen. Joe Bamford is the chairman of both Rise Hydrogen, which produces green hydrogen, uh, and also Wright Bus, which aims to use it in bus fleets across the UK and the world. And Laura Sands is a former Conservative MP, indeed the Times called her the sane, one of the sanest MPs, um, who has since made her name in the world of new energy systems. She sits on the board of the gas network uh, company SGN and of the energy systems catapult. I'm going to ask my panellists in a moment for five minutes of introductory comments then we'll turn to those online to ask for questions, which our team are trying to mop up from various different channels. So I'll hand over to Ben Houchen to start. Well, thank you very much. And hopefully everybody can, uh, can hear me. And firstly, can I start by thanking uh, Policy Exchange for inviting me on to this panel. It's something, as you've already rightly said, is something very dear to my heart because I do think hydrogen will play uh, one of the central roles along with things like carbon capture and offshore wind and, and other energy mixes in making sure we reach our net zero target by 2050. And I think so far, hydrogen has been underutilised in our fight against climate change and in, our, in relation to our um, fight to reach net zero by 2050. Um, I think we're also slightly behind the curve in relation to some of the nations that I think have uh, grabbed onto this agenda uh, much more quickly than they have, we have. But that's not to say that we can't catch up because I think there's a lot of um, geological elements and I think there's a lot of technology that resides within the UK that means that we can close that gap and we can overtake and we can become a world lead in what will be, I think, not just a 21st century, but a 22nd uh, century technology uh, that will help us decarbonize our economy. Everything, as has already been mentioned, from cars right the way through to some of our large industrial processes. Some of you will be wondering why I'm even on this panel. Um, some of you will know, but you know the reason I am on this panel and one of the reasons I am such a strong advocate, as I should be for my region, is that at the moment, the Teesside, Tees Valley area, produces uh, just over 50% of all of the hydrogen produced in the UK. That's largely because of our chemical and processing sector that we've had uh, 
since since the war, since the Second World War, that has led to the the first modern uh, integrated chemical plant that was in uh, Teesside that was ICI. And actually, Teesside is a place that's done hydrogen, whether as a fuel source or whether as a byproduct or whether as um, an alternative uh, feedstock since the since the 60s. So we've already got the expertise, we've already got the technology or some of the early technology, and we also have a big chunk of infrastructure that allows us to play a central role in that argument. And again, just to give you uh, just one figure, Teesside already produces excess hydrogen. So one of the big arguments is if you're going to test technology, where do you get the hydrogen from? Because of the industrial processes we have, we're already producing more than 1,500 tonnes of excess blue hydrogen every single year. We produce more than 10 million tonnes of excess green hydrogen every week. Um, and I think if you're looking for a place to test technologies, to scale up and to try and commercialise hydrogen on the scale that we need, uh, then obviously my argument is we should bring it to Teesside. And thankfully, very recently, as has already been said, stealing a bit of my thunder there, um, is that earlier this week, uh, Teesside uh, and the Tees Valley was, was named as being the location, Middlesbrough in particular, as the UK's first um, hydrogen transport centre, which we'll see us develop a lot of those technologies, work with the likes of, of Joe and the people at RISE and, and other companies across the, across the country, Alstrom and everyone in between on trains, buses, planes, um, automobiles and, and everything in between. So it's a really exciting thing for us. Um, we want to be a place where we can scale that up. I think it's one thing having the technology here, but one of the things that I think we're really interested in, as well as the economic benefits, as well as the uh, the climate benefits and the decarbonisation benefits, is the spin out of the technology that's produced, the uh, IP that's produced, and then hopefully the spin out businesses that are produced, for example, through the hydrogen centre that will hopefully as a result of being spin out of the Teesside hub, will be located in Teesside as well, which has huge economic benefits to driving up um, the quality of jobs in the region, driving up the, the demand for people to come into the region rather than this brain drain that we've seen over many, many years, because we all know that younger generations are extremely keen and are highly moral people in wanting to push forward with their low carbon agenda as well. And then the very final thing, which I'm sure when we get into the detail of questions and it always ends up this way, is that how hydrogen actually links into the large, larger ecosphere of our decarbonisation agenda. And I think the other reason that we are right slap bang in the middle of where a lot of this is going to take place is because of carbon capture, utilisation and storage. And, and programmes like Net Zero Teesside, which will be the world's first industrial scale carbon capture and storage facility, which allows for that transition. Um, because to preempt one of the questions that we will get is how do you produce clean hydrogen rather than just hydrogen that is from a high carbon emitting sources? Well, the transition phase to from brown hydrogen through to blue through to green is that transition through blue hydrogen, which will be off the back of carbon capture and storage. It is the way at the moment that we see that transition over the coming years. And again, that is a place that Teesside knows that we're at the centre of as well. So I'm just really pleased to be on a, a panel of such esteemed people who know far more than I do about hydrogen. Um, and I'm looking forward to answering people's questions over the next hour. Thanks, Ben. Uh, over to you, Joe. Hello, my name is uh, Joe Bamford. Um, I have been a hydrogen advocate for a long period of time. I've been looking at it for about 15 years. And really, from a, quite a simple point of view, um, my view on zero emissions is when do you get mass adoption? Well, you get mass adoption when um, it costs the same, it does the same, uh, and it's as easy to fill up as your main mode of transport. Um, and for me, I think hydrogen uh, can do all of those things. It doesn't quite cost the same yet, but I think it can do. Um, and I think we can do something about it. And when you start looking at transport, there are two zero emission solutions. Um, there's batteries and there's hydrogen. But at the moment, Britain, um, you know, we have a COVID crisis. We're also coming out of Brexit. Um, and we're going to need lots of jobs in Britain. And when it comes to zero emissions, um, China have done a brilliant, brilliant job on batteries. They have 73% market share um, in batteries, which when anyone has 73% market share in a business setting, it's kind of difficult to knock them off their perch. So my view in business is you go somewhere where you can compete and come out on top. Um, and there are less people, or have been until the last six months, less countries really looking at hydrogen as a really uh, interesting mode of um, green energy. So when it comes to Britain, you start saying, right, how do we 
to get green energy going and our green hydrogen going? Well, wonderfully, there's a, you know, we have lots of wind, we have lots of water, so you can make green hydrogen. Um, as um, um, the mayor of Tees Valley just then said, we also have blue hydrogen, which I think you will absolutely need as part of the transition. What does that give you? It gives you energy security in your own country, which is fantastic. Um, but when I talk about China, I think China's done a brilliant job on these batteries. And we should do the same with Britain on hydrogen. We should start saying, right, how do we look and grab hold of this? And you don't have to do it in a very, very large way. And you'll hear lots of different people in the hydrogen supply chain. But all of them need to actually sit there and work together because you need to match the supply uh, to the demand and know which product is ready when over the next 10 years and then match your demand to that. Look, in my case, we make buses, but actually our main focus has been looking at demand, you know, um, for the production. We're, we're, we're making hydrogen and green hydrogen from a wind farm. And so we've gone into buses because there's demand. If I have a filling station uh, and a bus depot, I've got 200 buses going home. If I've got 200 buses going home, I've got demand. If I've got demand, I can make production. Once I've got production, I can apply it to trains and ferries and ultimately around to uh, hydrogen for heating, probably around 2030 when you've got to get the cost base down. You see the cost base at the moment for hydrogen is not high. I can deliver hydrogen for the same cost as diesel to a bus. The bus is twice as expensive, but with a bit of volume, we can get that to cost the same. And, it, and then it goes, therefore, back to what China did with batteries. Once you've got um, volume in your home market and you've got the cost base right, you can then go and export that around the world. And I'm just really saying, if we could get it going here, um, we could have lots of jobs in Britain, jobs in manufacturing, which is close to my heart, um, and jobs in manufacturing don't happen in big cities. They normally happen in tertiary towns, and they stay there for 50 years, and that, I think, is very good for Britain. Um, and also energy security in our home country by turning our abundance of wind and our water into, into energy. It's kind of a simple solution. You can fill up the bus in seven minutes. It does everything that a diesel bus does. Kind of cool. Anyway, that's my opening introduction. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I'm going to turn over to uh, Josh Burke. Great. Thank you very much and uh, very glad to be here. So I think it's worth stay, stating straight from the off that hydrogen is, is not a silver bullet. Um, and there's lots of discussion between hydrogen and uh, electrification. This, this problem is a false dichotomy. You know, we need both of them. Trying to decide between the two can lead to a policy paralysis. So both energy vectors are desirable, useful, complementary, and above all, essential in the energy system. I think one of the often overlooked things in, in the hydrogen debate is the alignment between industry and, and shipping. So if you look at where the ports are and where they map with some of the areas of heavy industry, um, this gives you a really good opportunity of where you might want to apply some of the hydrogen that's produced, for example, the Humber is not only the UK's largest industrial cluster, but it's also the largest and busiest port by tonnage. So I think we're looking at where we might apply hydrogen in the system. We've got to look at these kind of overlaps here. And then another point on the application, I think this is a very personal one. Only yesterday, a new coal mine was approved in, in Cumbria. And part of the reason for this was to apply, was for the reason to, to use coal in heavy industry. Now, if hydrogen was in the mix, this sort of planning decision might not have taken place. And certainly it feels like it's contradictory to a net zero target to have uh, a new large open cast coal mine uh, gain approval. I think the second point worth making here is around jobs and hydrogen has the opportunity to feed into the government's leveling up agenda. It could generate tens of thousands of resilient high wage jobs. And particularly when the economy is below trends such as the present time, these, these would amount to net or additional jobs. And certainly that's that would be value right now. And these would be jobs both in the short term and the long term. So they could be both uh, uh, beneficial in the post pandemic recovery, but also th thereafter. Next, I think there's a big uh, question over public acceptability and a big question on, on, on how uh, industry and government engage with people about this. You know, to us, it's quite an interesting topic, to, uh, but to others out there, it's a fairly esoteric topic. And this could lead to questions about its validity in the energy system. Um, I think it's also important to recognise the origins of the hydrogen debate, really. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that it's not uh, valid, but, you know, the, the agenda is being pushed to some extent by 
the gas networks who are looking about how to manage their assets in a dark decarbonized future. They have a gas network, which is extremely valuable. And indeed it could play a large part because of the gas mains replacement system in delivering hydrogen to homes. But it's important to at least recognize where this debate is being driven from. Uh, and that, because that ties into some of the acceptability of, of hydrogen as a fuel. And then in terms of what happens to consumers, if, if a city unilaterally decides to, to, to switch to hydrogen as Leeds has done, what happens if energy bills go up and consumers don't have a say in what in their in the choice of their energy fuel order? So I think these questions around acceptability and public engagement are, are absolutely critical. But to tie this all together, we need the right policy environment, and this is where a lot of my work has been focused on. We need to scale up production, and as Joe said, we need to balance the supply and the demand side drivers in tandem. That's absolutely critical. And the policy environment needs to be enabling. And a big part of this is carbon pricing. Um, carbon prices need to be higher. Um, it's okay, I think, at the present time to start with uh, grey hydrogen or blue hydrogen, but we need to move to, to green hydrogen at some stage. But this can only come competitive with grey hydrogen over the next decade if the carbon price is right. And from our research, we think that a carbon price between 70 to 90 pounds by 2030 would be high enough to displace uh, grey hydrogen with, with, with green hydrogen. And lastly, as Ben touched on, you know, we don't want to be left behind in this uh, in this green race, so to speak. And when you look at the UK's um, investment in this relative to some of the other EU countries, we, we are falling behind. So within the UK's 30 billion plan for jobs, which represents just 1.3% of UK GDP, um, there's a small amount there for hydrogen. But when you look at France and Germany, they've put forward um, post pandemic recovery plans worth 4% of GDP amounting to over 100 billion. So, you know, these aren't the same amounts all going to hydrogen, but as a proportion of our spend, we're, we're already falling behind our EU counterparts. So it's very important that, you know, if we are wanting to seize this opportunity, um, we do so quickly. Uh, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, and um, thank you very much, Policy Exchange, for including me on this great panel. Um, I have to say I totally agree with Josh, particularly about this issue, that there is no competition between hydrogen and electricity and all sort of energy vectors. I mean, actually, we need them all, and we mustn't play a sort of zero-sum game. There was a bit of that going on between solar and wind at the beginning of the renewables game, and it's, it's really not helpful, and we do need it all. Um, I know Ben knows this, but I always call hydrogen the Heineken of the decarbonisation technologies, i.e. it reaches the parts others find much more difficult. And I think that if we look at this, we've got a very wide range represented here, whether it be transport, but also trains, industry, um, and also actually supporting the electricity, the green electricity sector, by looking at interseasonal storage, because I think one of the things that we forget is that um, our green electricity requires some form of storage, and actually hydrogen is a very, very useful and important um, part of that mix. But I'm particularly interested in, in the heat side, and Josh is quite right, obviously people in gas networks are interested in, in heat and decarbonizing heat. I mean, personally, I don't think it's going to be, again, one size fits all. Again, it is not that silver bullet. We're going to have a very mixed heat economy, and that will include all sorts of different um, options. But we also have to understand that, that hydrogen does play a useful part. Um, if we go down a full electrification um, of our heat system, we will have to get into people's homes. We will have to retrofit them. We will have to um, in, in, actually sort of start to change um, some of their internal environment. Um, we've had a bit of a problem getting smart meters into people's homes. So the idea that we're going to be able to do this in mass scale. Now, that's not to say that electrification won't play its role, but I do feel that hydrogen will play an important role. It can do a lot of the heavy lifting with very little of the consumer having to change its behavior. Um, we've already got uh, hybrid boilers that are, that are being developed by people like Bosch, which are about 100 pounds more than an existing boiler. And so I think one of the first steps was to, would be to give us optionality. We're not going to have a decarbonized heat system 
um, you know, until 2035 in totality, we have to start it now. But actually what we should be doing is ensuring that we've got as consumers optionality. So um, I think that we need to ensure that we've got the consumer side sorted. The industry itself, the, the heat sector does have to do all the heavy lifting. And while electrification will be able to be rolled out from today, because we've got the technologies in place, I see that um, heat decarbonization through hydrogen is going to be a bit of a hockey stick in the sense the sector is going to have to organize itself and then it can be deployed, but then it can be deployed with very little um, sort of confusion or interference when it comes to um, consumers. But I do think we've got some opportunities today, and that is that certainly the heat sector um, could take 20% of um, its capacity um, as hydrogen blended already. It's, that is all totally um, safe. And of course, Josh is right about acceptability, but we could help like Joe is with transport, like Ben with his off takers and his demand profile in his area. Um, the heat sector, the networks could actually take, uh, could start that demand profile rising. And I think that's really important. I just wanted to finish on, on one point that Josh touched on, but also Ben, and that is um, about how we go through this transition from a jobs and economic point of view. We do need to ensure that there are bridges for those people who are currently in the oil and gas sector. Um, we can't just abandon communities. We cannot have the same problem that we had in the coal communities. And if you look at the profile of hydrogen, not, not at the network end, but at the production and um, the processing end, the overlap between those jobs, which are highly paid today, to hydrogen jobs are very, very, the trajectory is very, very good. So I think we've got to ensure that we um, maintain those economic centers of industrial centers, but those jobs and those communities really need a response, which might and should be, in my view, um, a strong focus on hydrogen. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, just a reminder to those watching online, um, you can raise your hand uh, on the Zoom app. You can also use the uh, Conservative Party uh, uh, app, the platform, um, to raise questions. Um, but I'm going to kick off. Um, we've had several discussions or several comments throughout uh, the, the opening remarks um, about what's needed to supply, uh, to, to balance supply and demand as we go through the transition to, um, uh, to invest and localize uh, investment in, uh, in particular areas um, and also to raise the carbon price. Um, all of this starts looking like something like a strategy um, uh, but, but there have been multiple calls for a UK hydrogen strategy. I'm going to ask uh, you, Ben, when, when you're um, going to meetings with ministers and saying, you know, how, how, do we make, how do we get this off the ground? How do we show confidence to investors, uh, including investors like Joe? Um, what, what are you asking for for the Tees Valley? Sorry, still on mute there. there we go. All right. <laughs> That's not the first time I've been muted. Um, I think, well, firstly, we, need, we do need government to back an actual strategy and get behind hydrogen as one of the main focuses of decarbonisation. I, I agree with everybody. There is no one size fits all. It will be part of a wider energy mix uh, and a decarbonisation mix. But at the minute, there seems to be a lack of direction. Now, I would say in, the, in recent weeks, actually, with uh, discussions with, with ministers, it seems to be that maybe towards the end of the year, we might see the emergence of a hydrogen strategy and the government putting it much more front and centre along with things like CCUS and other uh, electrification and battery technology, etc., which I think will be a big step forward because that gives investors a huge amount of confidence to look at this technology into the UK. And I think the other side of that, which I've been largely frustrated on for the last three years, is that not all of the answers will come from government. And I would say this one as a devolved mayor, but, you know, the Teesside chemical and processing cluster, as I said in my opening remarks, we've been doing hydrogen for more than half a century. It's the same in Grangemouth, it's the same in parts of the Northwest, those kind of post-industrial areas that we have, with which Teesside is one, that still has very large chemical and processing industry, knows the answers to a lot of these questions, has a lot of the expertise, is looking at developing the technology further than where it is at the moment. And I think 
trying to get government to buy into the fact that they can learn from other parts of the UK rather than for all, all those having to control things from the centre. But just as a little anecdote on that, you know, two years, it was only probably about 18 months ago, maybe slightly more, that Bayes even set up their own hydrogen team within the department. And we felt like we went back to square one with that because then the team felt like it needed to do its own work to understand hydrogen by itself when all of the answers were already out there and they wanted to, to do it in isolation because then you get to this whole argument about favouring areas and clusters up others. So they kind of went into themselves for, for a long time. And I think that was that's the thing that's caused us to go behind the curve is that there was a recognition we needed to do something, but the internal workings of government to get their own head around what they needed to do over the last 18 months has probably caused us to slip. Now, if what I'm hearing is right, and we do get something much more substantial towards the end of the year, then absolutely, I think we can we can catch that back up. But I think there's got to be a recognition. I think, as Laura said, one, that it's going to pay, play part of a wider energy mix, which I think there is an acceptance that this isn't going to be the silver bullet, as people have said. And also, how do we make sure that we do level up? Because let's be honest, a lot of this technology, a lot of the production end of this hydrogen work will be in our northern post-industrial towns like Warrington in Cheshire, Teesside, and further north in Grangemouth as well. So how do they make sure that they're clustered around that at the production end? Because it's very easy to, to lose that. And, and I think as well, an understanding that industry is doing a lot of it itself already. So we're speaking to some of the big industrial players in Teesside, which unfortunately will have to remain anonymous at the moment, who use uh, hydrogen in their furnaces uh, and, and heating processes already, not as a feedstock or a byproduct. Um, and they're already looking towards them, their headquarters for huge investment to convert their natural gas furnaces into hydrogen. Um, so they're already moving in that direction. Um, so I think there's a big opportunity, but government, I do think, need to get, you know, get their act together and I think they need to speed up the industry hydrogen strategy because I don't I also think it compares slightly with CCUS and I think giving confidence to the market that this is a technology that the UK government buys into not necessarily as the answer but a part of the mix then that gives confidence to the market to be able to take on some of these challenges it was the problem back in 2010 with CCUS when the White Rose project got cancelled and that set CCUS back for years because the market didn't know whether they were going to get a, a market-friendly environment for CCUS. And I think there's still a bit of a dance at the moment on hydrogen as to whether that is the case for the UK government. So clear signals to the market will absolutely help. Thanks, Ben. Clear signals to the market, confidence in, for investors. Joe, you're, uh, you're playing in that field. So what, what sort of barriers are you seeing to, uh, to expanding your, your, uh, your output and, uh, and production? Uh, yes, uh, look, I do agree with Ben. Um, you know, there are um, sort of issues on it. And um, there is a sort of suspicion um, from civil servants, particularly, um, uh, that as a businessman, I'm trying to sort of leg them over somewhere or other, um, which I'm, uh, I'm really not. I just think for Britain, it's a, this is a great solution. Um, no, look, the uh, Department of Business at this point in time uh, is, I think, you know, at least pushing on a hydrogen solution. But for me, hydrogen starts with transport. I mean, I know people look at me and go, oh, he's a manufacturer and that's why he's doing buses. No, actually, my real business is how do we make hydrogen and deliver it for the same cost as um, the prime mover? Um, and where does it start? And I, in my view, it's on buses. Part of um, the problem, though, is uh, the civil servants in the Department of Transport are obsessed with batteries um, and batteries being the only solution for transport. You see, the problem with hydrogen is you do have to marry up supply and demand. And if the business department is sitting there going, yes, we want to do production of hydrogen, it's great. But if I've got nowhere to sell it to, OK, you've got a load of production. Now, if I've got a load of vehicles that run on hydrogen, but no production, we've got the same problem. And so this silo mentality of transport and business being separate is kind of a difficult thing. We need the um, transport department um, to really understand that that's the first case scenario for hydrogen. Transport is a very good user of that. And if you think about wind at two o'clock in the morning, you could turn that into hydrogen um, and, and make that for transport, that'd be great. But there is an obsession with the civil servants in the Department of Transport um, that batteries are the only solution. And look, they are a good solution, don't get me wrong, but yeah, as you're coming out of these crises again, we need a few strings to our bow as Britain. And, you know, 
in a, in a business case, when someone has got 73% market share in an area, it's really rather difficult to knock them off the perch. And there's only two real ways to do it. You either have something that's cheaper or have something that's better. Well, in the case of channel and batteries, I don't know how you can be cheaper and, and how do you make it better? Okay, I went at the very beginning of January to see the sixth or seventh largest manufacturer of batteries in China. They have 80,000 people just doing battery research. Now, let's put that in simple context. Um, Britain throws out 10,000 engineers a year from university. So in the sixth largest battery manufacturer in China, they have a total eight years worth of our capacity. I would suggest that you don't spend money necessarily chasing batteries in Britain, but go after a totally different solution um, and actually replicate what China has done on that solution because they've done a very, very good job on it. Um, so that's really, I suppose, the, the thing. We do need the Department of um, Transport and the Department of Business to listen. Also, not as a businessman, be suspicious of us that we're trying to leg them over. I'm trying to find a solution that A, helps me and I can employ lots more people, but B, provide solutions as quickly as possible that people want to adopt um, and people want to use on, on transport. And like I said, the most difficult thing to change is human behaviour. We are used to getting in our vehicle, filling it up, five minutes later, doing seven or 800 miles uh, and, then, and going on to the next thing. That's what hydrogen does. The difficulty, though, also as well is, like, the, the difficulty, I suppose, for, even for, for, for Ben here, would be potentially, for me, the best thing to do is to give me a five-year contract around buses and hydrogen because I can then marry up the two. I know that I've got a certain amount of buses every year so I can make the production. Once I've got the production, okay, it's a modular thing and I had the next bit of production next year. Now, if I know I've got X amount of buses every year for the next five or six or seven or 10 years or whatever it is, I could go back up the supply chain and get the cost down as quickly as possible. Because at the very, very beginning of this, you know, still all the supply chain is still a slightly scientific experiment and they all need to become productionized like Henry Ford did with, with the, the car. We need to do that. And if Britain could do that and really get into hydrogen as one of the strings to our bow coming out of the COVID crisis, I think we would do very, very well at doing this. So that's really my challenge. I'm ready to invest. I'm ready to do stuff. Uh, ben, if you'd like me to come to your, your area, I'm very happy to do that, my friend. Um, but, you know, I do, would I suppose, need the Department of Transport to be less obsessed with batteries and more uh, excited that hydrogen can pay a big part in, in the energy decarbonisation for Britain. Thanks, Joe. Um, Josh, what, what do you make of that? There's, there's a lot here in trade-offs and, uh, and, 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 you know, how, do, how does hydrogen fit alongside its alternatives, especially batteries? Um, but I'm going to turn to Laura in a moment to ask about how, how we can make uh, both the transport uh, system reliant on, uh, on hydrogen alongside a heat system. Um, do, do, they, do they all work together? Um, Josh, what do you think? Sorry, Josh, you're, uh, you're just on mute. We'll just take you off. Sorry for that. Go for there it. For once, it's not me who's making the <laughs> mistake with that one. Um, I think part of the challenge with hydrogen is just understanding where it's best placed to make a contribution because it's a really um, useful energy vector that can be applied you know, across the system. It's kind of thinking about where, where does it have most value added. So from my perspective, um, from the work that we did previously with policy exchange, there's there's a couple of sectors where it's got a clear uh, application. I think you know UK steel. There's a good opportunity there for the UK uh, to become a leader in green steel. Unfortunately, we've just opened a coal mine to feed into for steel production, but we're seeing countries like Sweden with with a scheme called the hybrid scheme. They're now getting on and doing it using hydrogen to produce green steel. Obviously, the costs initially are far higher than. Uh, otherwise it would be if you weren't using hydrogen, but they're looking to bring those costs down quite significantly. I think the freight sector, as we've seen in Alstrom buses, um, the heavy uh, heavy freight sector, I think that's where hydrogen has a, a much bigger advantage over um, batteries. I don't really see hydrogen making any headway on the kind of consumer consumer side. I think that, that battle is lost, so to speak. Consumers kind of 
you know, putting aside the range anxiety, I think consumers now kind of understand the electric vehicle proposition and quite happy with that, where, where hydrogen has an advantage is on some of the longer distance journeys, buses, trains, um, haulage, that's where I, I kind of see hydrogen being applied. And then on the, on the production side, you know, the UK does have a comparative advantage or has the potential to have a comparative advantage. We have um, unique um, proximity to geological storage that other countries don't have. We've got the supply chains from the oil and gas sector and the expertise there. So if we could harness that, we could use that to produce hydrogen and would CCS and bury that um, in some of the some of the uh, offshore storage sites. And that's where the UK has a, a um, an advantage that other countries might not have. Um, turning quickly to heat, I'm pretty skeptical, I have to say, about the blending side of things. I think it's um, it delivers when hyd blending hydrogen into the, to the gas networks, I think it delivers fairly marginal emission savings for what is quite a lot of effort. You know, in the short term, that might be a good way of building up um, the supply side of things. But eventually, you'd need to, I think from, you'd move, need to move to, to full hydrogen in the gas networks rather than blending. It might be a decent interim step, but for me, that's that's not really making a huge dent in our in our emissions. And then lastly, it's something that's probably a bit more nascent, but something that I think is quite interesting is the role of electrolyzers and hydrogen more generally in balancing the system. So we've seen in, in some countries in Europe where electrolyzers are being used uh, and they're playing in the um, uh, market stability mechanisms that, that those countries have. So electrolyzers can help balance supply and demand in addition to using hydrogen as a seasonal storage. So lots of applications, some of them are quite niche, um, but I think that the challenge is really working out where, where the value add is with, uh, with hydrogen. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Laura, uh, hydrogen is not uh, uh, something for consumers. Um, what, what do you make of that? I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's something that we have to discuss with consumers and, and build trust around it. Um, I would pick up on, on Josh's point about the 20%. Actually, that's something one can do today. And it create, it starts a demand profile. So it starts to help with the production side. But of course, it is absolutely not addressing the overall sort of carbon footprint of, of, of heat. But I think actually what you said was you asked us about policy responses. And I think we've all agreed that there needs to be a hydrogen strategy and that that strategy needs not also, as Joe constantly says, and quite rightly, is not to sit in a silo away from electricity, away from other things. It needs to be integrated as a proper system wide and actually complementary technology, because as Josh said, and I feel very passionately about constrained energy from our wind farms. I mean, this really should not be wasted. Um, so I think that what we need is a strategy. Um, government, I think, are considering a CFD in terms of hydrogen to try and start kickstart that supply chain, hopefully look at some of the cost trajectory that we've seen in offshore wind. Um, these technologies, these are the things, um, as actually, I, I wouldn't say instead of batteries, but as well as batteries, we should be putting um, innovation and in many ways sort of production um, trials to actually start looking at, at what, what we can actually get out of cost reductions, efficiencies. Um, one other interesting thing that um, actually could start also help kickstart a lot more production, and that is our nuclear fleet that are coming off grid. They're not unproductive. What they are not is stable to be on the grid. However, there's a, quite a, many years left in them, and they could be used um, to create green hydrogen pretty quickly and at quite massive scale. Um, and that's what I would call repurposing an existing asset um, and ensuring that we're really sweating the capital that we've already invested in these things. And then I still come back to these, um, these hydrogen ready boilers, just because they give you optionality and it means that nobody um, is cut out of a hydrogen solution as we go forward. Can I, do I, can I just, sorry, can I just jump in quickly? Because um, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily buy this argument of um, it not being a consumer technology. 
because again, just as a very real example, I think it hasn't been communicated well to the public. So I don't, I don't think the public know about it rather than they wouldn't adopt it. But for example, my first real experience of a hydrogen car was three days ago when I got in one and it was just, it was a really nice kind of saloon car, like any other car you would expect, more silent than an electric car, which comes with other issues. But you, you could, you can do 350 miles on a tank of a hydrogen car that exists today. So it's not, you know, if you improve the technology and get better range, et cetera, that's as it is today. And you can pull up if you had the infrastructure, which you could argue is the existing gas network that could be used, but you could pull up to a forecourt if the infrastructure was there and refuel your hydrogen car in 90 seconds. The biggest problem we've got with electricity, and obviously, yeah, batch technology will improve, supercharging will improve. But from a consumer point of view, you kind of say, well, hydrogen is really no, you try to communicate to the public anyway that hydrogen is not different to petrol and diesel, really. It's very conventional in the way that you use your car. It's conventional in the way that you refill it. And so actually, I, I don't think it's that people are against it. What you find is, and what I found this week, the only negative when people talk about hydrogen at all is this very old view of, well, you know, what about the blimp that, you know, caught I mean, to, all the times that more to be frank, there's Can a I just quickly? I'll, ju I'll just take you, you one at a time. Um, uh, Joe, you, Joe first and then Laura. I'm so sorry, Laura. Um, Ben, look, I do agree with you. I could very easily make you a very simple argument. You want jobs in Britain? Uh, well, uh, Hyundai and Toyota are both massive car manufacturers, both have plants in the UK, uh, both have uh, hydrogen cars that they want to roll out. Part of the problem is this chicken or egg thing. There are 8,500 filling stations in the UK. Um, now, I think if you turn around and said, right, the British government in the next three years will put in 4,000 hydrogen filling stations. What would that do? Well, that would put lots of jobs in Britain because there are only two manufacturers of filling stations. So how would you get them to be here? But if you did do that, I think you have the conversation then with Toyota and Hyundai and say, look, if you do that, would you put jobs in Sunderland? Would you put jobs in, in Derbyshire? Um, would you do those sort of things uh, if we're going to do that uh, and make all your hydrogen vehicles for the Western Europe um, here? I think that's one of the cases to do it. The other piece, I suppose, and I'm just discussing here, here and looking at it um, even with Laura on, on hydrogen for heating and hydrogen for steel and everything else, it's very simple. Over the next 10 years, you know, going to, you know you're going to need hydrogen in certain parts of the economy. There is a case for getting going now. OK, so now we have hydrogen buses. There's three bus manufacturers in the UK who make a hydrogen bus. I have hydrogen production. You start with that and get the cost base going. And over the next 10 years, you look at when you need to get the stuff ready for the market and, and how. The equivalent price of running a bus on diesel is about six pounds a kilo of hydrogen. The equivalent price of running a house on on natural on hydrogen is about one pound fifty. But if you spend the next ten years going down the cost curve, when when you're needing hydrogen for housing and heating, it's probably around twenty thirties when it starts coming in. By that time, you can make hydrogen for one pound fifty a kilo because you've depreciated your assets over the next ten years. Look. You've got buses ready today. Trains really start coming in in 2022. Uh, ferries around 2025. OK, now, if you want to do ferries in Britain, right, the Scottish government owned 48 ferries. Uh, we've got two bus manufacturers of, um, you know, um, uh, ferries in, in, in terms of Harland and Wolf and Ferguson Marine. Marry the two up, get the local universities to educate people around hydrogen, uh, you know, decide the Scottish government's going to buy 10 hydrogen ferries by 2025. Um, and there we are. We've got jobs in those areas. These aren't beyond the wit of man to get going on it. Thank you, Joe. A uh, lot of enthusiasm and uh, a big vision there. Um, Laura, you were... You were no, I mean, talking. just to, to, just sort of reiterating um, Ben's point, but on the heat issue, and that is that if we are to decarbonise heat, which we have to do, and it is the biggest heavy lifting, in my view, right across the whole economy, um, we either have to electrify, which will include people going into your home and messing around with the inside of your home, all sorts of issues about the technology. Do you understand heat pumps? How do they manage? What is their, uh, their thermal efficiency, et cetera? Or what you do is you, with a lot of consumer confidence, is you start to roll out hydrogen, which actually means very, very little change, if any, within the home. And I think that's the consumer acceptance. And in some ways, that's the consumer 
conversation that um, that needs to happen. And actually, the climate change um, sort of their their um, the work that they've been doing has said that there is a lot more interest in the least amount of effort on a consumer's um, from a consumer's perspective. Josh. Uh, this is all sort of a discussion on the on the point about consumers uh, that that you opened up. What what, what do you make of those uh, comments? Yeah, I think uh, you know echo a lot of what the others have said. I think um, when people talk about hydrogen, it kind of has these connotations of the Hindenburg. So there's this huge barrier to to get over there, and I mean, perhaps that's you know it's kind of a bit generational thing. You know, I speak to my parents; that's what they think about my about my generation. Are, you know, too young to, to remember that, so it might be less of a challenge. But um, I certainly think that the consumer engagement piece is, is critical for legitimacy, uh, for scale, um, you know, and, and the pace of, of change that we need. So, you know, as Laura alluded to, spot meters are very good. You know, they're not quite analogous, but, you know, that has been a really, really painful process for one tiny little bit of kit. Now, if we're trying to go into people's homes, rip out boilers, and put in other bits of kit that are bigger, um, you know, uh, require lots more uh, mess and uh, effort, then you know it's going to take a very, very long time for us to, to to roll this out. So, understanding consumer aversion to these things, I think, is critical. Um, and and then a, a, just a broader point that we made in 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 the paper around, um, you know, the. the the full scale conversion. People talk about, oh, we, we converted from town gas to, to high, um, uh, we made the, the town gas conversion back in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, that's analogy. Again, people say, oh, we could just do the same to hydrogen. But I think a critical point, what's different from then and, and now is that we had a very um, centralized market then where the government controlled everything. It was very top down. And so, you know, to make that huge conversion again now in a liberalised market, I think would be quite a challenge. So that's a slightly separate point to what we've just been talking about, but I think an important one in, in terms of how we, we think about what, what is possible. And I think as well, when we talk about the consumer, a lot of it comes back to our, all of our point, the point that we all agree on, which is the government have put all their eggs into, so far, have put all their eggs into the electrification battery argument which hasn't then allowed for a public conversation and communication and an education on, on things like hydrogen, um, which will just play a part. Like I say, it doesn't exclude, as we all know, it won't exclude batteries and electrification, but it should be playing a much larger role, largely because of the lack of information, because the government put all their eggs in that basket. And the only other thing I would add on the, the homes bit is, I think you're right, because of the decentralization, it makes it more complicated. I think when you go back to the the pre-conversion uh, that we had, we actually had a higher percentage of hydrogen in our network back then, and we were kind of going, trying to go full circle, albeit to deliver it is much more difficult. But I remember speaking, I think on this panel last year, we had a representative, I think, from the Northern Gas Networks on, um, and uh, it's a number that's always stuck in my head, irrespective of what we do in the home, especially if you go down heat pumps or refitting of existing boilers, we have a target to decarbonize by 2050. We have almost 30 million homes in this, country if you work back from that the numbers of trying to actually make those conversions are absolutely astronomical you're just not going to do it it's two it works out at you know roughly two boilers a minute twenty thousand a week a million homes a year being fitted retrofitted or replaced boilers every day you know a, a million boilers every year for the next 30 years to 2050 just to meet our target so i also think that Actually, the, the decentralization of it allows for different solutions in different areas. But actually, I think this could help accelerate that if hydrogen was taken up, because you, you know, I think with the existing replacement of the gas network as it is anyway, you can probably ramp up potentially over the coming years to 100% hydrogen in the gas network, which means that, like I said, the intrusion into people's homes, the take up of people, the fact that people don't want to actually you know, do anything but are quite happy to adopt the new technology if the communication's there. It seems like hydrogen is the path of least resistance uh, when you look at the scale of the challenge that is in front of us. I look, Ben, I do agree with you, and I'm going to pop in here because look, the hydrogen market is predicted to be two and a half trillion by 2050. Do we, Britain, want to engage in that market? Because the reality is. Over the last six months, the German government have announced that they're going to spend nine billion on hydrogen. Uh, French, roughly 12. Even the Portuguese are going to spend six billion. And we're still 
deciding whether we're going to do something or not. This market is going to be a big market. They predict it's also going to have 30 million jobs. I think we're going to need to actually get some people employed in this country. And I think if you want to start pushing on certain things, um, you know, we need to get those jobs in certain areas. You know, if you if you talk about going into batteries, yes, you're going to need those in the economy, but we don't have any anything to do with those. We don't have any of the chemistry. Uh, we don't make them. Um, we don't do anything in that. We've got to go into areas coming out of this crisis where we can do, um, you know, um, well in our own economy and drive that. And this is a solution that most replicates human behaviour. Look, on transport, um, well, when are you going to get this mass adoption? Going green is not most people's number one choice. Some people, yes, I want to go green, it's my number one choice. Most people use transport to get to work or and it needs to be cost effective. Going green is like number five or six. So I think if you can most replicate how they are and if you can give them a solution that costs the same and with hydrogen on a total cost of ownership today on a bus, including all the fuel and everything else, we're about 20% more expensive. If you gave us um, 3,000 buses, I could get them to cost the same as a diesel bus. And hey, presto, it does every single thing a diesel, bu a diesel bus does. On a battery double-decker bus, it'll do 60% of the distance and take four and a half hours to charge up. That doesn't seem like a very good solution if I'm a bus operator to me that I need 40% more buses. Um, so I, I think, you know, yes, you say I'm very energetic and enthusiastic about this. But yes, I think you have to be in Britain coming out of this. We need some, some good and positive stuff over the next five years. And we need to fill up a load of jobs in our country. And this is one of the solutions that can do that. We certainly do. Um, Josh, quick, uh, quick comment on that. Yeah, you know, I don't want to, you know, after that optimism, I don't want to <laughs> sound too um, pessimistic. But I just think it's worth bringing it back to the fundamentals, which is, you know, it's very exciting um, area for development and potential for jobs, but, but right now we don't produce it at large enough quantities um, with sustainable methods, whether that's with CCS or through electrolysis. So yes, it is exciting, but we're at the very start of, of, this, uh, of this journey. We need to really focus on the production side before we kind of can move this um, any further. So, you know, a small dose of realism, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, that side of things, I think, is worth, worth mentioning. Thank you. Um, uh, but on the dose of realism, let me explain on the production. Be, be very quick, Joe, very quickly. I will have enough for 800 buses by the end of next year. So, actually, I'm doing putting my money where my mouth is, um, and I think we need to just do the with this. Sorry. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we are Policy Exchange, so I'm going to ask each of you for a, um, a, a single line policy um, for, for uh, making hydrogen, making the most of hydrogen, um, or, or reining it back if that's, uh, if that's what's needed. Um, but before you do that, I'm just going to say that there's a, there's a packed uh, program of Policy Exchange events throughout uh, the Conservative Party conference. You can find all of those on the Policy Exchange website. That's policyexchange.org.uk. Um, so um, over to the uh, panellists. I'll start with you, Ben. Oh, sorry, Ben, you're on, you're on mute. All right, no, I just think we need to put hydrogen on the same footing and on the same platform as, as other technologies like electrification and batteries. So it is a part of that wider mix, and that starts with the government giving it the same credence as, as those other technologies by coming up with and publishing and giving its full backing to a, a published hydrogen strategy. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Laura? Yes, I mean, I think we need the CFD for hydrogen. I think that that would start to, in many ways, normalise it and create that equality between el electricity um, and hydrogen. Um, but I would say also that we need some innovation projects to actually start testing this and picking up on Josh's point, those innovation um, projects really need to engage um, consumers as well as part of the overall supply chain, because without consumers, we haven't um, we, we, we haven't made the case. Thank you. Uh, Josh? Um, higher carbon prices is what I would say. I think um, we need that clear signal to the market. 
and eventually we need to displace green uh, a gray hydrogen with green hydrogen and higher carbon prices is is, is one of many policies that could do that. And Joe. In the case of transport, I think we need to make hydrogen a fuel under the bus service operator grant. Uh, and I think also on a renewable transport fuel obligation, uh, we should take the additionality clause out of it so I can use any wind farm in the country uh, to make green hydrogen from. Brilliant. Thank you very much um, indeed for, for those, uh, uh, those, those uh, proposals and also for uh, a really um, excellent discussion from each of our panellists. Um, thank you very much uh, to those uh, joining us online um, and we, uh, we hope to see you all soon for the rest of the, uh, the Conservative Party programme. Have a good, uh, good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.